Hey guys, today we're going to learn how to visualize three-dimensional spins or arrows arranged on a two-dimensional periodic lattice. A system like this can also be easily extended to three-dimensional lattice, where you have multiple layers of these things, or whatever your arrangement of spins might be. In my work, I need this fancy publication quality plots of spins to be able to visualize the artificial spin ice system that I'm working on, and also to be able to look into its magnetic structure. I was also using these kind of plots on uh, a conference poster that I was uh, presenting at the Artificial Spin Ice Conference not so long ago, and I will be using them in my master thesis uh, later on, as well as in my paper that I'm just about to start writing. In this tutorial, we will be writing functions to organize our code. Uh, keeping code organized in functions helps to make it more versatile, because you can easily make variations of the same figure, and also you can uh, reuse some of the functions in other programs, not necessarily related to plotting, just as I do. For example, two of the three programs, or two of the three functions that I'm about to show you, are actually part of my main Monte Carlo simulation script for my uh, project. So that's why uh, we will be working with functions uh, in this tutorial. But before we even start thinking about writing code, we need to consider three things. One is a way to create a periodic lattice of points or positions where our spins will be later attached to. Two, we would need to describe individual spins and define the directions that they're pointing to, which in this case will be restricted by the geometry of the lattice, which means we only have four possible directions they can post, uh, point to. And third, we need to make sure that the spins we create with their respective directions get attached to the correct positions on the lattice that we created. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you think that I should create more videos like this, which will greatly help me to judge which content to post more often. Thank you guys, let's get started. And just a disclaimer, I'm using Julia version 1.93 on macOS Sonoma 14.0 and on running it on my Apple M1 um, MacBook Pro. So first of all, we would need to install the necessary packages if that's not already done. So for me, I have commented out uh, the lines of code that add the necessary packages, which is because I have them already on my computer. So there is no need for me to do it. Next, we will need to import them to be able to use them. And because this is a graphic application, we would need to be able to um, render the graphics, right? So we will need to also activate JLMeki with this line. So now let's get started on the actual uh, system setup. So first we need to define the parameters. We have a system of 36 spins or 6x6 where we can define cells like this and each side will contain three cells. Then we can also define the lattice spacing J, which is equal to 1. So the two nearest neighbors that are at 90 degrees to each other will have the distance 1. And last but not least, the length of each element, which is equal to 1 as well. Each spin on the lattice is at 45 degree angle to the x-axis where the horizontal will be the x-axis by convention and the vertical will be the y. So once we're clear about the main things that will define the system, we can go ahead and create a struct for our parameters. Next we go and call that struct. So we call it something, I called it letter capital letter C, as the parameters you would pass in the numbers that you want your system to look like. If I would like three cells, that will give me six spins across each side, and then I'll have a length of one, and then also distance between the center to center of the nearest neighbors, also one. And then pi over four, so 45 degree angle for each spin relative to the x-axis. Okay, now let's see how we can generate the lattice position vectors, or lattice points. So here's the lattice with the origin in the middle, and then the blue dots are the lattice uh, points. L is the distance between two outside corner spins, center to center, and we can uh, calculate it as 2 times n, but that's not the whole story. Let's look uh, closer at the lattice itself. So we have the J spacing that defines the number of units between these two corner spins. So we get five of these. 
So that means the length is equal to 5. So we have to subtract 1 from the L, and that gives us the correct length of the side. Now the outermost left spin in the corner is at the position minus L over 2. On the right-hand side, it's L over 2. So we have to iterate between these positions column-wise. And also, by our convention, we go column-wise to... Now that we have that, we can go ahead and write our functions. The first function will be to generate lattice points, or the position vectors for each spin to get assigned to. So the lattice is periodic, has a side length L, and it's in terms of j-spacing. So that's the little formula I came up with to get our side length. So this formula ensures that as you increase n, the system size increases proportionally. So if n is equal to 1, uh, it gives us 4 spins. If n is equal to 3, it gives us 6 spins per side. And with that, we would have 36 spins total on the lattice. Nested loops are used to iterate through x and y positions on the lattice, and with that we will create a list of position vectors where each spin will be later assigned to. So let's run this. Uh, well, this doesn't run. Uh, we will need to activate. We'll set up our struct. Now if I run this, and then, well because it's a Jupyter notebook, I have to do this in order to show you how the um, container looks like, how the vector of spin vectors looks like. So if I run it, I create a vector of 36 elements where each vector inside of it is a position vector for each spin. Order of these vectors inside these lists is very important because later it will help us to be able to match the uh, spin direction vectors with these positions. Now that we have our spin vectors, we need to go back and think how to create our spin vectors themselves. So let's pause for a bit and see how we want to set up the problem. There are two ways we can order the spins on the lattice. So one would be ordered configuration, and the second one would be random configuration, where spins are in no particular order. So let's look at the ordered configuration first. If we pay attention to a single cell of four spins like this, the spins are numbered column-wise inside each cell. So the spin one has a the direction pointing downwards to the right at an angle beta, so we can uh, set x, y, and z components like the follows. And also the spin 2 points up and to the right with the following components. Spin 3 is exactly as the spin 2, and spin 4 is exactly as spin 1. Now we need to generate all spins on the lattice. So let's look at the columns. So there are two types of cells. In odd columns, every two spins point head to head, and even columns have two spins pointing away from each other. Each cell repeats three times per column. So let's see how we want to set it up in our code. As I just introduced, we'll start with an ordered spin configuration. First thing we have to do is we have to create this cell of four spins. So just as shown on the uh, iPad drawing before, we have spin 1, spin 2 defined in the following way, and spin 3 and spin 4 are um, basically the same. So that defines our cell, and then we have a number of columns, which is equal to 6 in this case. And again, creating an empty vector to store our spin values. So when it comes to creation of the spin direction vectors, uh, we have to also keep in mind the order in which these elements get added to the empty array over here. Um, so once again, we do a for loop. We run over each column. So we would start by iterating over each column, and then uh, we use the list comprehension to decide which spins to push into this uh, container. So we check if the column is odd or even. So if it's odd, which one? If it's odd, so 1, 3, and 5, then we take these two spins and append them to this container, repeating the, uh, the pair three times, because n equals 3, remember? So that gives us six vectors corresponding to the first column. Now, if it's even, then we take the spins 3 and 4, so it's a pair of spins, and we repeat them three times and push them into the container 
for a second column. So that gives us second uh, like second set of six vectors uh, for the second column and so on. And we do that until we run out of columns. And so with that, we have um, created all our spin vectors and we can return um, that container with the spin vectors and their directions. We can also do the same thing and create a randomly oriented spin configuration. A randomly oriented one is slightly shorter. So we have the cell of four spins that we have defined, number of columns, empty array to hold our spin vectors, and then the loop. And we're still looping over the columns, except for the fact that now we multiply each spin by either plus or minus one randomly. So basically give uh, a random direction to each vector, but only along the four defined directions uh, as on the square lattice. And then we do the same thing. We append it three times for each pair and we get our randomly oriented system. Now that we have these two uh, larger arrays containing 36 vectors each. One contains the spin positions and another contains spin directions. We can easily match them up. So if you have a first spin in one array and the second spin in the other array, they are to be matched. That's how we pair them up in the order they appear in the array holding them. So let's look at that. So now we are at the point where we actually have to plot our system. So this is our main function, so to speak. So we import the parameter struct, then we call the function that generates spin position vectors or the lattice points. Uh, next, we have to generate the spin vectors themselves, um, either ordered configuration or random configuration. Here I define some of the constants, uh, which are like spins per side um, or the total number of spins in the system. It will later come in very handy if I incorporate them in the um, file names for storing our pictures of the system. Um, I think that's the only place where I use these things. Now we have two arrays of vectors, position vectors and spin vectors. You can't plot them in a way that the data is stored um, coming out of these things. Uh, for plotting in Mackie, we have to convert these three-dimensional points in space to, so to speak, tuples of three-dimensional tuples, tuples of x, y, and z components. And you can do that easily by using the point 3f function from the geometry basics uh, library that we imported earlier. Um, so you do that for every spin in that uh, array. And then you do the same thing for the spin configuration vector. This vec3f function turns every spin vector into a um, into tuple of x, y, and z components. Uh, but I also multiply it by 0.5 of the length of the vector, just because I don't want the vectors overlap. Like my vectors are supposed to be not touching when they're plotted. Uh, and if I don't do it, it doesn't work properly. The, the, the vectors will start overlapping. So now we converted our data to the format appropriate for plotting. And then we move on to create a figure. Um, my resolution is pretty high here because I really want the uh, spin vectors looking crisp and nice. Then I create an axis uh, where I have only one subplot. So it's one row, one column. If I wanted to have two subplots, um, I would say say here one, or two, one and two, like one row, two columns, then I will have two snapshots. But in this case, it's just one, one uh, figure. Um, aspect ratio, um, I make sure it has the, it uses the data as the source for the aspect ratio because I want the system to look square and not rectangular. Um, and then the perspectiveness. This, what gives your uh, system that nice look when you look at it, when at the plot, um, the spins in front look larger and the spins at the back look slightly smaller and at an angle. So it provides perspective to the picture and the pictures look much nicer this way. And then this is what actually makes the arrows. Um, so the arrows function from the Mackie library. Um, so you can import, um, so you call your axis, you um, call your positions and directions. Uh, you define the color of your arrows or the lines that define the arrows uh, or the lines that like the outline of the arrows. Um, I chose gray. Um, I also chose nice light gray color for the arrow heads. And the quality of the arrows themselves uh, is set with this line. 32 is pretty high uh, and if your computer can handle it, it's great. Then it's going to give you very nice and clean and crisp arrows. <clears throat> but you can also like lower it if um, uh, 
the runtime is an issue um, or your computer graphics cannot handle it. Next, we set the arrowhead size. So this 0.3, 0.3 gives the how wide the arrowhead base is. And uh, you have to give it the length of the arrow, but divide it by two, because otherwise it will create very long arrowheads and this won't look good. So I wanted my arrowheads to be roughly half of the um, length of the arrow itself. So again, this is something you can play with to see how you like it. I happen to like this kind of setting. Line width and then align center. Align center makes sure that the arrows are positioned uh, on the lattice um, in the middle. Like say, if you have an arrow and you have a tip and a tail, uh, the arrow itself will be attached to the lattice in the middle of the arrow. You can make it so that uh, the tail of the arrow is attached to the lattice position, but then uh, it will give you a completely different picture. So you also have to play around. There are different parameters you can use. Okay, so let's see uh, what you can use here. Here, align origin. So there are different, different ways to align it. You can choose tail end, head, uh, line end, whatever you like. But for me, what worked to be able to visualize the system the way it actually is designed uh, and simulated is this setting. These guys here make sure that the picture we create have has no axis, ticks, marks of any sort. It's just spins themselves on the white background, nothing else. Okay, and last but not least, we save the figure. Uh, you can use the comment, the function save to do that. Call it whatever you like. I reference the number of spins in the file name. I usually use the Jupyter Notebook to create a prototype of the program. It helps me to like check for errors and everything. But once I actually like get it done correctly, I copy every cell here and put it in the Julia program, like in the Julia script with the .jl extension, um, and then run it like this. Uh, it's I just I just prefer it this way. You copy every single function. Uh, I prefer to separate my functions by uh, a line like this for visual um, separation. So there's a slight difference how I write the main function though. So once I create the struct here, I don't immediately define it. Uh, it's just sitting there waiting to be called inside the main function. And so here inside the main function, I call it then. These n, l, j, and beta parameters, this is something we can vary, right? And uh, when, you, when you call the plotting function at the end, uh, you can like just call the function, give it some numbers, and it will scale the system accordingly. So let's try and run it. For example, you can run it and create a very nice, cute, one-celled system, which will give you only four spins. So let's see. So that's what we've got. We've got our system of four spins. You can pan it around uh, to get the view you like. Sometimes I do take screenshots of the view that I need. And if I were to bump it up to, I don't know, let's do 10 and see if what that's going to look like. That's going to be interesting. Ooh, that gives us a very nice large lattice. Okay. Um, all the spins here are ordered. So if you can, as you can see, everything is pointing to the right and looks very neat. So now let's try and create a randomly oriented lattice. So I use then these guys. Okay, so running over the mu hat here, mu hat rand, and uh, saving the appropriate one. Okay. Okay, so let's see. Well, indeed, as you can see, this gives us a completely randomized orientations um, in the spins. So now no longer are all of them pointing to the right. Okay, that's about it for the tutorial. I hope you liked it. Let me know and see you next time. Bye guys.